Hello and welcome to Crash Course Cryosphere. I'm Tom. And I'm Simon. And this week I'm going to be looking at mass balance. This is how ice is lost and gained from ice sheets to glaciers. Whereas I'm going to be looking at energy budgets and radiative transfer, something that's much more important than what Tom's talking about. We've examined how water becomes ice, and now we need to look at how a glacier is born. A glacier is defined as a body of ice that flows downhill under its own weight. Therefore, there are two requirements for a glacier to form. Firstly, enough snow and ice must survive the summer melt season for there to be an ice mass present from year to year. Secondly, there must be enough massive ice for it to deform and flow under its own weight. This concept of flow is very important, and to show how important it is, we actually refer to ice that is no longer flowing, that once flowed, as dead ice. It is no longer part of a glacier, it is no longer flowing, and therefore it is dead ice. Ice flow is a complex and fascinating business that we will explore in detail later. First of all, we must look at how a glacier is maintained. So we need to understand how glacier ice forms. Glacier ice looks very different to the ice you might have in your freezer at home. Glacier ice is this deep blue colour. And this is because it absorbs non-blue wavelengths much more readily due to the lack of bubbles within it. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Simon here, just to say that this mechanism for why glacial ice appears blue is actually really, really cool, uh, but we didn't have time to talk about it in the series. So if you'd like to learn more about it, I've left a link in the description. Um, sorry to butt in. Tom now wants to talk about how glaciers grow with each year's snowfall. As the annual layers of snow accumulate, the ones on the bottom will start to become glacial ice. We're going to try and demonstrate this for you now using this Perspex cube, our soapy snow, a little bit of water, and this water bottle. What I'm first going to take here is the winter snow. You can see here that it has quite large flakes. So I'm going to add this now as our first layer. Here we go. Oh, 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 okay, we're going to do it from the front, I think. Yeah, there we go. So this is our first layer of snow. Okay, so that's our first winter layer of snow in. Now, I'm going to add this summer layer. We have much smaller flakes, expertly carved by Simon. They're smaller, partly because you generally speaking get smaller snowflakes during summer, so there's less chance to grow, and also because that generally represents the final ice crystal structure a bit better. So now I'm going to add this summer accumulation layer. Okay, it's very much finer, so it takes a bit more to get a good layer in. It smells lovely, by the way. Lemon and citrus. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to add just a little bit of water in. This water is to simulate melting and refreezing. Hopefully this should percolate down into the winter layer somewhat, and that's a similar effect as to what you see in the real world. So it's a little bit of water just to wet the top of the summer layer. And now I'm going to apply a little bit of compression using this water bottle. This is to simulate the weight of the stuff on top and the compression taking place. Hopefully, what we should start to see is the top layer is compressed quite firmly and the bottom layer is starting to seal up. The particles of the winter layer are not fully bound together yet, but they're starting to do so thanks to the water input from the summer and the pressure from the other layers above. I'm just going to keep doing this now and hopefully we should start to see the pattern evolve whereby the bottom layer is going to get more and more compressed as compared to the top layers. So here we go. Okay, so now I'm just adding the last winter layer in, as time has magically fast-forwarded. Running a bit low. And hopefully you can see the pattern that has emerged between these winter and summer accumulation layers. Now, this is something that if you ever end up studying ice cores, or look at ice cores at all, is very useful. Because of course this means you have a perfect record of when each year was. You can simply count the layers that you see in your ice cores, and therefore count how many years have passed. This means that ice cores are a very good way of measuring the climate if you can establish an absolute date for one of the layers and then count back from that. Well, I don't think that went too badly and hopefully you can see the different layers that we have here. Tom is of course exactly right that ice cores are a valuable source of data on past climate. But how do you get those ice cores in practice? It's time to take a trip to the archives. 
So it's easy to see those accumulation layers if they're in a perspex cube, but in real life we need something a little bit more involved, and we have corers. We have two small examples here. What are these? <laughs> well, so you go out on the ice and you want to be able to investigate what's going on underneath the layers, so you need to be able to collect it somehow. Now, on the face of it, it's not really obvious how that might work with these, but like many things designed for use out in the field, they, uh, they do have some hidden secrets. Um, so that's that part. And then if I just gently pull, you can see there we've got a nice groove to put your ice in. So there are two pieces here, this bit. I'm not going to put it all together, but you can see that slots in there nicely. Um, and then it just clips in place, and there's a drill bit on the end. You can twist it in. Exactly. And then once you've done that, you've got your little groove, so then you can take a slice. There's a, oops, just pop that down, a slight serrated edge right on the end there that you can just about make out so that you can get a bit of purchase on your ice. So you just pop it in, then you've got a little column of ice that you can... So the idea is then, yeah, you can see the accumulation layers as you go down through. But th this is a very small example. It is, yeah. So how big do these things get? Uh, they get very big. So... Uh, Typically, somewhere like the British Antarctic Survey have a big store of these ice cores, and they can be that much in diameter. So, what's that? About 100 mil in diameter. Mm. And there are these huge drilling rigs, so they might go down by a kilometre to go and get these things out. And then, of course, they have to store it, and quite often they'll take slices and they'll look at the gas pockets that are in the slices and analyse those. There's a lot of analysis, there's a lot of things you can determine from it, because these yeah. are time series, aren't they? The, yeah. the, the further deeper you go, the further back in time. Yes, yeah, so it's a bit like tree rings. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you're getting lots of layers, and each layer has qualities related to the time that that snow fell. So, so yeah, in a nutshell, that's it. So you've got something handy that you can just pop in your rucksack or on your sledge if that's how you're travelling, or your skidoo. Um, it's fairly lightweight, it's probably a kilo there I would think so quite a big lump of metal um, and you can go and do your little bit of collecting so with something like this you probably wouldn't be storing it to take it away you'd just be collecting it and doing an analysis there or mm -hmm. yeah uh, something a bit more basic than with the really big cores but these are really rugged instruments you know, these are designed to take a beating in the field these aren't, yeah. this isn't some precious laboratory thing that's you know the slightest <laughs> knock will destroy it well the polar regions if you want to go and work in the polar regions you first of all have to get to the place which is by definition remote so mm. everything that you take with you has to be able to withstand the travel and the experience you're going to put it through just getting to these really difficult places to reach and if you lose them, they're very brightly coloured. That is true, very they important. Definitely need that. Uh, I haven't seen it with these, but quite often you see pictures of skis stuck in the snow. And the reason for that is because if you lose your skis, you're in trouble. So they <laughs> stick them up so they can find them. So possibly something similar happened with these as well. We'll be back in the archives next week. Now we're going back to Tom, who's talking about how fluffy, freshly fallen snow turns into hard, dense glacial ice. The mechanisms that increase ice density are movement by the wind, changes in the size and shape of the crystals themselves, changes in the internal structure, and movement between the ice crystals. These processes are greatly accelerated by the melting and refreezing of water on the surface of the glacier. An interesting thing to note here is that pure ice has a density of 917 kilos per meters cubed. At four degrees Celsius, which is where we pick because it, water changes its density with temperature, at 4 degrees Celsius, water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed. This is a strange property of water and is one of the fundamental reasons why ice floats. Simon will take a look at the physics of this in a future episode. But glaciers don't grow forever. We've just been talking about accumulation here. And if just kept accumulating, then eventually that ice would reach into space, which clearly doesn't happen. So somehow the glacier is losing its mass. One of the concepts that helps us understand this is that of energy budget, the energy budget of the glacier. Now, unfortunately, this means we're now going to have to talk some physics, and so here comes Simon. Okay, so we've got energy, but what does that mean and how does it move? Energy can be defined as the ability to do work. Pretty general, right? Well, that's because energy can come in lots of different forms, like kinetic, potential, uh, even nuclear. But when it comes to physics, this is the key definition. And the key thing when it comes to energy is what's called the first law of thermodynamics, which sounds scary, but honestly it's not. All it means is that energy can't be created or destroyed, only changed from one form to another. 
An example of this would be, for example, somebody bungee jumping. They stand on the top of a cliff where they have a lot of gravitational potential energy, then jump off, gaining a lot of kinetic energy, then the bungee cord will expand and stretch and stretch, slow them down and convert their kinetic energy into elastic potential energy. At no point has energy in this process been created or destroyed, it's just changed from one form into another and into another. The Earth as a planet experiences lots of these changes of forms of energy all the time. And all the energy that's coming into the Earth, apart from a small amount which comes from geothermal heating from the Earth's core, comes from the Sun in the form of radiation. Now, radiation isn't what you're thinking, probably. Radiation isn't what you might be thinking of as nuclear radiation, which are alpha particles and beta particles and gamma rays that are emitted by nuclei undergoing certain reactions. What we're talking about here is radiation in a general physical sense, which is the transmission of energy through a medium. So between the Earth and the Sun, there's no air, there's no water to transmit energy, it's just a vacuum. But that doesn't matter to radiation, because radiation arrives in discrete packets or chunks of energy, which we call photons. These photons travel all the way from the Sun to the Earth and are absorbed, providing all the energy input to the Earth energy budget. An example energy budget would be that radiation arrives from the Sun, providing our input, and then some of that radiation might be reflected by, for example, snow, so it gets pushed back out into space. But some of it would be absorbed. Now, some of that absorption might take place in snow, for example, which would then raise its temperature by increasing its thermal energy. And it might be enough to melt that snow, changing it to water, which can then flow out of the system, carrying thermal energy with it. So we have input from the sun, a process happening, and then an output from the system. This kind of surface energy budget, and others like it, are absolutely key to understanding how ice evolves. We can understand how glaciers gain and lose ice by picturing it as a very simple system. A system with inputs, such as the accumulation that we've already discussed, internal processes, the subjects of many future episodes, and outputs. This gives us the mass of the system. And the mass of a glacier is fundamentally controlled by its energy budget. And therefore we have what we call the mass balance. Mass balance refers to the change in the amount of ice in a glacier over a specified time period. Mass balance is divided into two components, the accumulation and the ablation. Accumulation is the input of ice into the system, and ablation is the removal of ice for the system. Accumulation can include things like snowfall, as we've already demonstrated, but there are also other processes such as avalanches down onto the glacier of the surface from the surrounding mountains. Accumulation rates can vary greatly depending on the local circumstances. One of my favorite examples of really incredibly quick accumulation rates is the Patagonian ice fields down in South America. Here you have warm, wet wind coming in off the Pacific and hitting the mountains very quickly, and therefore you get huge rates of accumulation, as much as 14 meters per year. In contrast to this, you have the Antarctic dry valleys, where accumulation rates are measured in fractions of a millimeter. Snow is typically the most significant input. However, you can get other inputs via supercooling of wind-carried water, which produces rime ice, or via the upwelling and ponding of water onto the surface that then freezes and then becomes part of the glacier itself. Now, both of these processes, the supercooling in particular, are relatively small contributors. But because supercooling is so fun, we're going to do a demonstration of it anyway. Supercooling is the process where a liquid is cooled below its freezing point, but it doesn't become a solid due to a lack of nucleation centres. Now, water, which is very pure and handled very gingerly, can be supercooled in lab conditions, which is what we're going to try and do in an experiment for you. Well, when Tom says that we are going to do this experiment, what he means is that he is going to do the actually fun bit. I have to do the setup. What I have in front of me is our experiment in constituent form. So to talk you through, we have a bunch of regular old table salt. We have two lovely jugs here full of ice, which is actually the most ice you're going to see in this whole series. And a Perspex cube with these two bottles of water. Now, this isn't just any old water. This is very, very pure water, which is deionized water that we bought at the supermarket. This one's been dyed blue, but you'll see why in a little bit. Now, the way this experiment works is we need to get these down to a really, really cool, very cold temperature. So first of all, I'm going to put a whole bunch of ice in this cube. I think that mostly went in there. So as of the moment, these bottles are now getting 
going to be getting quite cool, but they're not going to be getting cold enough to properly freeze, or to get to freezing temperature, because remember, we're trying to supercool these. We don't want them to actually freeze into ice just yet. So we need to help this along a little bit, which is why we have the salt. So remember that in episode one, we talked about the fact that when substances undergo a phase change, for example, from solid to liquid or from liquid to solid, there's an associated latent heat, a certain amount of energy that is required to go undergo that transition, which is to do with changing the molecular bonds. In ice's case, when ice melts, it goes from a crystalline structure to a more incoherent liquid structure where there are less bonds between each individual molecule. We are interested in trying to unlock the power of that, that phase transition, and we're going to do that using our salt. So salty water has a much lower freezing point than fresh water. So if I add a whole bunch of salt to this ice, as I'm doing this, I'm lowering the freezing point of the ice in this Perspex box. What that means then is that it is currently, oh, look at all that go. This ice is currently solid when its temperature would indicate that it shouldn't be. So it's currently more, oh, I can taste salt in my mouth. Currently more thermodynamically stable for the ice in here to be liquid than it is to be solid. So it's going to undergo a phase transition to water. Doing that, however, requires, oh, so much salt. Doing that, however, requires energy from somewhere. It needs energy to break apart the crystalline bonds, the hydrogen bonds between its molecules. And it's got to find that energy from somewhere. So what it does is it takes energy from its surroundings. And its surroundings, in this case, means our bottles of water. So it robs a whole bunch of thermal energy from the bottles, and doing that lowers the temperature of them. And if we're lucky, we'll get these down to about minus 8 degrees Celsius. So what I'm now going to do is leave this for 30 minutes and uh, let Tom come and do the actually really cool part of this experiment with you. Thank you, Simon, for that. It's always good to have a helping pair of hands. Now, in what we showed you just now, we actually forgot to add the water on top. We did that straight afterwards. Unfortunately, what we don't have here is a thermometer in order to measure it to minus eight. Our budget doesn't go quite as far as the BBC, whom provided us the inspiration for this experiment. What should happen is I'm going to pull out the blue bottle and then I'm going to put some ice cubes in here, or rather I'm going to do the ice cubes first, pour the blue bottle on top. What we should, we should see happen is that the water will freeze on contact with the ice cubes and then freeze back up into the bottle. That's the idea. Let's see if it happens. The second thing I will do is then slowly remove the white bottle, hopefully it hasn't been disturbed too much, and then I will wrap it on the table, and hopefully we should see that from the point of disturbance, i.e. the bottom of the bottle, the water will freeze from the bottom up. Okay, moment of truth, my heart is genuinely beating quite fast right now. Uh, let's see what happens. Got the lid off, that's a start. Nope, that's not cold enough. Ah, that's so upsetting. Sticking your finger in it, it is very cold, but clearly not cold enough. Now, a possible reason that didn't work is because we added blue food dye, which may have modified it slightly. We'll give the white bottle a go now, and let's see what happens. This is science, by the way. So much during the course of my PhD, and I'm sure that during Simon's as well, you try something, it doesn't work. So you just have to keep on trying and trying again until you find something that does. Yes, freezing, we have freezing, we have freezing. There's a bit of freezing at the top there. Ah, here we go, yeah, we just need a bit more agitation. There we go, yep. Yeah. Don't know if you can see this on the close camera now, but the core of that water is now frozen. Ha <laughs> ha, sort of success. And now we need to remove glacier mass from the system. This is done via ablation. Ablation is quite simply the removal of ice from the system. And this can be done through a variety of means. The main one of these is just pure melt, but you can also have wind scour, iceberg carving into water, or dry carving, which is simply the avalanche of ice off the front of a glacier. Melt rates can be calculated if the energy flux from all sources is known. This relates back to what we were talking about earlier with Simon. This is usually expressed in terms of surface lowering. Of course, not all melt takes place on the surface, and radiation can penetrate into the ice and cause internal melting. This creates planes of refrozen water as the ice melts in the sun and then freezes again at night along ice crystal boundaries. The key points in this episode are 
that in order for ice to become a glacier, it must exist in a layer thick enough to survive the summer melt season, and thick enough for flow processes to occur. That the mass balance of a glacier is the accumulation, such as snowfall, minus the ablation, such as melt. That with a lack of appropriate nucleation centres, a liquid can be supercooled below its freezing point without becoming a solid and that a way to understand how much melting or ablation will take place at a given point in a glacier is to consider the energy budget at that point. Thank you for watching Crash Course Cryosphere. If you'd like to take your understanding of the subjects covered in this episode further, there are links down there in the description. And if you have questions about the material covered, then Tom and I will be in the comments for the next two hours after this is uploaded. We'd like to thank all of these lovely people up here who helped make this series possible, and in particular, the Recover Project at Exeter University for helping fund this, and the Scott Polar Research Institute for housing us and being so accommodating. We'll see you next week for more icy action.